In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. St. Thomas Aquinas says that no example of virtue is absent from the cross, and that whosoever desires to live perfectly need to do nothing more than to despise the things which Christ on the cross despised and to love those things which Christ loved. The primary virtue which is apparent to us as we gaze upon the crucified Savior is the virtue of charity. Greater love than this no man hath that he lay down his life for his friends, our Lord said. Among the various kinds of love of man, by far the most powerful is the love whereby he loves himself. Every man has within him a fire of love for himself, a self-esteem by which he at least seeks to be virtuous and by which he looks after his many personal needs. Through this self-esteem, this legitimate self-love, he makes sure that he gets something to eat, something to put on, has reasonable comfort, and obtains those material things that he needs in order to carry on the duties of his state in life. On the spiritual plane, this legitimate self-love leads him to desire the salvation of his soul, to feed his soul with prayer, to keep it in good order by obedience to the commandments. This is why St. Augustine says that he who sins does not love himself. This type of self-love or self-esteem furthermore urges us to take the means of self-preservation and to carry out those projects which lead to success in our legitimate ambitions of life. This self-love is perfectly legitimate and even necessary in order that the human individual and the human race function properly. Without it, people would become excessively dependent upon others, would become depressed, and would eventually die of starvation, exposure, or disease. Because this legitimate self-love is the strongest love in us, and the most unrelenting, the most faithful, it is necessary that it become the measure of all other loves of man. Love consists in desiring good for the person whom we love. When we love ourselves, we desire good for ourselves. When we love another, we desire good for that other person. Proof of true love, therefore, lies in desiring more good for the person whom we love than we do for ourselves. Hence, sacrifice or the suffering of loss for the sake of our friend is the true test of love. In the book of Proverbs, it says, He that neglecteth a loss for the sake of a friend, is just. Thus one way to show our love is to deprive ourselves of some external good thing for the sake of the beloved. In this way, for example, we give guests in our home what is the best, and we do without, if necessary. A yet greater way to show love is to suffer the loss of our own body for those whom we love. In this way, we put up with bodily pain and hardship for our loved ones. A mother would give her child a blanket 
and be cold herself rather than see her child shiver. Often St. Pius X, as a young priest, went without his own dinner in order to give it away to some poor family. The greatest possible charity, however, is to give up one's soul or life for a friend by dying for him. The greatest temporal good we possess is our natural life, the greatest possible sacrifice or gift of one's self is death. But our Lord Jesus Christ, in dying for us, gave us the greatest possible gift, the gift of his own life. And this he did after he had deprived himself of external goods for our sake by living a life of poverty and humility, and after he had handed over his sacred body to great suffering for us, through the scourging and the crowning of thorns, the carrying of the cross, the stripping of his garments, and finally his being nailed to the cross. Our Lord's passion is, therefore, the greatest example of charity, and we ought to endure every trial and every hardship for the sake of him. The Christian life is, in a nutshell, the loving of Christ more than ourselves. It is to imitate the sufferings of Christ on the cross in our own little ways for his sake as he endured suffering for our sake. For this reason, the priest, before he consumes the chalice, says these words of the psalm, What shall I render to the Lord for all the things that he hath rendered to me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. This taking of the chalice does not merely refer to the drinking of the precious blood, as even the most hardened sinner could do, but to the acceptance of the cross in his daily life, his sacrifice, the daily ho holocaust of obedience and purity of life, This is what our Lord meant when he said to James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were asking to sit on his right and his left in his kingdom. Can you drink the chalice that I shall drink? This chalice is his passion, for he will again, in the agony of the garden, refer to his passion as this chalice. Let this chalice pass from me. But submitting his will to his father, said, if it, if it is thy will, then let it be done. If you are looking for an example of patience, look upon our Lord Jesus Christ. Patience is shown in two ways either when anyone endures great pain with resignation, as when we are ill, or when anyone endures that which he was able to avoid but did not avoid, that is, taking on some hardship. But Christ endured great suffering with resignation. To him is assigned the verse of Lamentations from the book of Jeremiah, O all ye who pass by the way, attend and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. St. Peter describes to us his holy resignation. He says, Who, when he was reviled, did not revile. When he suffered, he threatened not but delivered himself to him that judged him unjustly. 
Isaiah said of him, he shall be led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before his shearer, he shall not open his mouth. At the same time, he was able to avoid these sufferings. Rebuking Peter, who cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest about to arrest Jesus, he said, thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father and he will give me presently more than 12 legions of angels? The greatest patience of all time, therefore, was exemplified by Christ on his deathbed of the cross. If you are seeking an example of obedience, follow him who became obedient unto death through this perfect obedience to the will of his Father, he overcame the original sin of disobedience. St. Paul said, just as through the disobedience of one man, referring to Adam, many became sinners, so through the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, many shall be made just. If you are seeking an example of humility, you have only to gaze upon the crucifix. Almighty God willed to be judged by a man, Pontius Pilate, and to be condemned to death by him and to die at his hands. Like Job, we can say to, of our Lord, thy cause hath been judged as that of the wicked. Like the just man in the Book of Wisdom, his enemy said, let us condemn him to a most shameful death. If you are seeking an example of despising earthly goods, behold the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords naked upon the cross, mocked, spit upon, struck, crowned with thorns, given gall and vinegar to drink, God dead upon the cross. If you wish to be unaffected by dress and riches, look upon Christ crucified as the soldiers below cast lots for his garment. If you wish to be unaffected by honors, look upon Christ scourged, mocked, and spit upon. If you wish to be unaffected by false dignities, look upon Christ with a crown of thorns. And if you wish to be unaffected by evil pleasures, then look upon Christ on the cross saying, they gave me gall for my food, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And if you wish to learn forgiveness of injuries, look upon Christ as he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And to the good thief, behold, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Charity, patience, humility, forgiveness of injury, detachment from the world, the love of suffering for Christ's sake, these are the things which make man great. And they are learned from the contemplation of the crucified Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.